Just to pray that God would speak through this. So Father, we, we don't want to ignore what you have to say. Lord, I don't want these words this morning to be my words, but Father, I believe that what, that what you would have me share with your people here. Father, that they're things that you've already shared with us, and so we're clarifying once again. But Lord, we ask that you would speak through your Holy Spirit this morning. Lord, give us ears to hear, a mind to understand, and hands and feet, Father, that are willing to go forth and do your work. Lord, bless us now, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, Corona has put our, our lives into a bit of a spin lately, hasn't it? And so when I was actually looking back at the, the goals of the church and the things, it was a bit of a, a struggle because looking at it, it's like, well, how on earth were we supposed to accomplish that when we couldn't even meet together for, for four months? And so some of our goals have been thrown out of whack, but other things have, haven't changed at all and continue to be done and are continuing to be done. And so this morning I want to re reiterate what some of our plans were and what has changed. But I want to start with what hasn't changed. What hasn't changed is our vision. We've said that we want to be a discipling church, actively pursuing Jesus' vision in our community and our city. Now when I say that we're a discipling church, it means that every one of us is a disciple and a disciple maker. It's not that it's for the pastor to do it, it's not that it's for the leadership to do it, it's that it's every one of us, because church is each one of us together. And so we don't just do it as individuals either, we do it together. We support one another, we encourage one another, uh, we celebrate when somebody has a win and we uh, cry with people when they've been abused because of their work for Jesus. We are the church, and so we do it all together. So our vision hasn't changed. Our mission hasn't changed either. To be helping people to think, speak, and act like Jesus. That's the simple way of saying it, isn't it? We want people to become like Jesus, just as we become like Jesus. And if you don't remember these, they're on the wall behind you. They're on the wall in a number of places around the church. So it's really easy. And on the front of the bulletins, uh, even though they're coming out electronically, it's on there as well to remind us that this is what we've seen, we believe God wants us to be good. We have some values. We used to have eight different values, I think it was. We've condensed them down to three things that we consider the core of who we are. The first one was above all, it's who? Jesus. It's Jesus. Above all, everything is about Jesus. Because without Jesus, we don't exist. Without Jesus, we aren't who we are. And so we say we place Jesus at the centre of all that we are and do. We worship Jesus through word and action, in spirit and in truth. And we recognise that without Jesus, we have nothing. That's at the core of the Gospel, isn't it? Without Jesus, we have nothing. Without Jesus, we go to hell. But we have Jesus, don't we? And because we have Jesus, He is at the centre of everything. Our second value seems to understand what the second one is because they're valuing each other a little bit too much right now. We value people. We love one another. We care about one another. So we love people as Jesus did and seek good for them. Sometimes seeking good for somebody means speaking a hard word. Other times it means showing mercy and grace to people when they need it. But we seek what is best for them. We seek what God says is best for them. We act with our expectation of return. Now that's countercultural, isn't it? Because this world says that if you do something, especially if you do something good, then you deserve something in return. You deserve to be paid, or you deserve a reward, or you deserve stuff. You deserve something if you do the right thing. We don't deserve anything, do we? Nor do we look for anything because we have already been given far more than this world can give us. As I said at the very start, we have our salvation. What more could we want? You don't want a Ferrari, Paul? Uh, uh, Ten look around, I don't have patience to drive on. <laughs> <laughs> and it costs too much to look after if something goes wrong. Why would we want that kind of stuff? When we have Jesus. We accept people as they are, while helping them to become like Jesus. We understand that not everybody has their lives together. 
and I'm not talking about people out there, I'm talking about people in here. We don't always have our whole lives together, do we? We might look good on the outside, but sometimes there's stuff going on inside that we feel that we can't share, or we can't deal with. And so we accept people where they are. We understand that we are all broken in some way, but that doesn't mean Jesus says, stay like that. Because through Jesus, through the Holy Spirit, he offers us ways to change. And he offers us a model of who to become like. But Jesus wasn't without problems, was he? People stuck nails through his hands, through his feet, they whipped him. They stuck a crown of thorns on his head. But did he complain? Not that we heard. He did say to the Father, why have you forsaken me? That does sound like a bit of a complaint, does it? But he never turned away from the Father. He understood that God accepted him, even if he struggled. He accepts us even when we struggle. The third value is the mission of God. We value the mission of God. We place God's desire for ourselves above our own. That's the way it should be, isn't it? If God is our king, then we put him above ourselves. We place God's desire for our church above our own. And that's something I value about this church. We don't come in here and say, this is what I expect the church should be like. And if you don't do it this way, then, then look out. Unfortunately, I read to Jenny this morning, uh, I'm doing, uh, doing a course through Money at the moment about leading this small church. And there was a, uh, in one of the questions, there was a, a guy who was talking about a small church that he uh, interviewed for. And basically, the, uh, the gist of it was, that uh, it's not about God, it's about what we want to do. And unfortunately, that church has never grown. It's known as a pastor killer. He, these are words that he used. Mm -hmm. And it's known as that. I know it's known as that. Because the people's desire is for themselves rather than for God. We understand that God's mission is to bring people to himself in which we have a role to play. In other words, None of us can convert another person. None of us are good enough to be able to do that. But isn't that a relief? <laughs> yes, it is. Because it takes the pressure off us. We can't convert anybody. We can't change anybody. The best that we can do is tell them about Jesus and allow the Holy Spirit to do the changing. But we have to be that part of the open. We can't just sit in the building here and expect the world is going to change by us being in here. We have to be in here and be out there. We have to be together and we have to be in the world. We have to play the part that God has called us to. But we had some goals in place as well. The first three goals were about numbers of people attending and baptisms and things like that, which we, we want to see. It's not about, um, if I don't get this many people through the baptistry then we've failed or anything like that, but it gives us something to aim for. Now obviously, when you haven't got people coming in the building, it makes it hard to do those things. So we sort of sc scrapped them for the moment. But the fourth goal was within 12 months to see a shift in the culture of the church towards discipleship, observed through changes in the how and why of church activities. That's still relevant, isn't it? Because you don't have to be in this building to be a disciple. It's a, a blessing to be a part of, of the church meeting. It's a blessing to be able to gather together. But just coming to church doesn't make you a disciple. A disciple is someone that constantly focuses on Jesus and seeks to live the way he calls us to do. And the good part is, even with COVID, we can still be disciples and we can still disciple others. And so that's still relevant. We want to see people growing in their walk with Jesus. How are we going to accomplish these things? Well, some of the strategies that we said, and I've got these a little bit out of order, was the first one was every activity and event we do will be measured against the vision, mission and values of the church. In other words, we don't do stuff just because it sounds good. And that was one of the things that this guy had said about this particular church. That this church, um, their sole activity, their sole outreach activity for the year was putting on a Christmas carols for their local congregation. Uh, not just for the congregation, for the community, sorry. 
and they would spend three months in the preparation of doing that. So they spent three months, do the carols on the night, and the return, I guess, what you could say, that they got for it was every couple of years receiving a letter from somebody thanking them for doing it. <coughs> One letter for three months' work and a lot of money. They weren't doing what God was calling them to do, were they? It was a good thing what they were doing, but God wasn't blessing it. It wasn't changing people's lives. It wasn't even changing the lives of those within the church. And so everything that we do, we want to make sure that we're doing it for the right reasons. And not just because it sounds like a good thing to do. Discipleship will permeate every aspect of the church. We will ask the question, how will this help people to think, speak, and act as Jesus did? Have you ever asked yourself that question before when you're doing something? Or about to do something? Or about to say something? Is this what Jesus would have me say? Is this what Jesus would have me do? Because the 80s, I don't think I was a Christian at the time, the What Would Jesus Do movement came through. And then later on people criticised it because well, we're not Jesus so we wouldn't do what Jesus would do. But it's still a good reminder, isn't it? That before I open my mouth or before I go and do something, is this what Jesus would have me do? Is this something that Jesus wants of me? And we should ask it of one another too, shouldn't we? said last week that there was some gossip getting around about, about Isabel. Before we share that stuff, or when we hear it, do we actually say to that person, is this something that Jesus would want to share? Is this what the Bible would call gossip? Because that's, about, that's how we make disciples, isn't it? That's how we disciple one another. It's how we build one another up. The fourth one on there, church reports will focus on stories and results rather than outlines of what we've done. We want to read about what was accomplished in people's lives because of these activities, not about the activities themselves. In other words, we want to hear the stories of what God's doing. Because again, that's how we disciple. That's how we become disciples, when we hear what God has done in people's lives. It's one of the things, um, I've heard some of Len's stories about how he ended up in the church here. And it was because of another man acting the way God would have him do. And because of that, it changed Len's life. And because of that, Len's changed other people's lives. We want to hear those stories, don't we? Not just about Len. Though Len would happily tell you the stories. So Jeanette's looking over at you, but she's another one that will happily tell you stories as well. And some of us are very quiet about what God has done, aren't we? Because for all sorts of reasons, sometimes we think God hasn't done anything, or who am I to, to share this? This is nothing compared to what God's doing in other people's lives. It's not about the, how big the story is, is it? It's about what God is doing. And so we want to hear those stories. It's why we she, that have been sharing testimonies in church. Because if we can't do it in here, then we're not going to do it out there. And so we want, we want to hear those. Not just for that sake, but to be able to glorify God for what he's doing as well. A new strategy that we've added to this is our main target. Our main target for outreach and, and evangelism. It's not the only one, but it is our, the main thing that where we want to spend our time and our priorities is on the Leichhardt State School. Now, one thing that lockdown has taught us is that we need to know your priorities. The school is the main meeting place in our community with the biggest grouping of non-Christians and the biggest challenges that need Jesus. We as a church need to be united on this. In belief, we, can't, uh, we need to all believe together that this is uh, the area that God has called us to and to these people. But we need to be united in action as well. Can I say, the school, um, I share plenty of stories about what, what God has done down there and how I do different things there. But it's not my ministry. It's not my area to go and do stuff in. It's together. Because there are problems in the families and things down there that I've never dealt with before, but some of you may well have. There are kids down there that I can't reach that some of you may well be able to. Sometimes a child needs a grandparent figure to look up to. I'm not a grandparent yet, and I don't want to be one for quite some time. 
But many of you are. Some of you have great grandparents. But there's kids there that need a good role model, somebody that can demonstrate love to them. And there are ways that we'll be able to do that. The school wants us there. And there are many schools around that say, we're not interested in the church. They only bring problems. But like our state school says they want us there. There is a chaplain there that needs support, that needs encouragement. There is a student wellbeing officer there that needs support and encouragement. And they're starting to run programs now, things like the Shine Girl and, and other things that they're looking at, where there'll be opportunities for us to be involved in personally. The school, I believe, and I believe that the leadership are saying the same thing, is that we are here to reach the school community. So together, we need to do that, not just one or two. And the last one was the role of the pastor is to be redefined in light of Ephesians 4. Who knows what Ephesians 4 says about pastors? It's okay. I know if you open up your Bible, you'll find it. If you have your Bible there, open it up, have a read. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11. As soon as I start to read it, some of you will think, ah, oh, that's right, I remember that now. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11. So it says there, So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers to equip his people for works of service, so that the body of Christ may be built up, until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. So this means that each of us needs to change our understanding of what the pastor does. And this includes me and what he is here for. And when I say he, I'm talking not just about me, but there will be guys that will come into this role after I move on, when God calls me to other places. And there'll be guys that will come in after them. For some of you, I may be your last pastor. Hopefully for um, many of you, there will be other pastors to come. Or you may go into a new church. The two traditional models of a pastor, the evangelical clergy and the pastor CEO. Now the first says that the pastor is here predominantly to preach and teach and visit. And for most of us, that's probably what we've grown up under. That that's what the pastor does. He's, he's there as, as a father figure. He does what a father would do. Makes, when you fall down, he's there for you to pick you up. Is there to teach you the lessons of, of what the scripture says. Basically, things revolve around that. And if he's not doing either or both of those things, then he's not doing his job correctly. The second says that the pastor is to run the church, to oversee all the ministries, make building programs happen, basically act like a business manager. And you'll see this in particular denominations and in, in larger churches where the pastor doesn't really know their people. They're there to, to oversee it like a, a business operation. Whilst both can be found in scripture in, in various ways, there is a better description of pastoral ministry that we just read in Ephesians 4. And Ephesians 4 is based as well around other passages that remind us that we're all called to do the work. That's not about one, one person supposedly at the top. It reminds us there that the pastor is the equipper, the trainer, but also one of the congregation, called to the same gospel ministry that every other part of the body is called to. He's not the only one qualified to visit others, nor the only one qualified to ask the hard questions or to lead or create ministries. Peter, Paul, Timothy, Titus and others, they were all living examples of the gospel to the church. That's what they were called to, to do. They, they were like everybody else, but they were called to be that living example and to equip others to also be living examples through every aspect of their lives. This hasn't changed for us today either. Myself, the leadership team, the um, care team, we act as models for each one of us, but that doesn't make us any better than anybody else either. 
it doesn't make us any more qualified than anybody else either. You hear sometimes in, and I've heard it in other churches, where somebody is sick and the, the senior pastor is busy with somebody else, so they send the associate pastor along. And that associate pastor is thinking, oh, this is great, I get to spend some time with whoever it is. But then through the grapevine, uh, you hear back later on, well, that that person, that person that was sick is upset because the senior pastor didn't visit them. And that happens in churches. That unless the senior pastor, because he's senior, he's the best, unless they visit, unless they're the ones that are showing up at the ministry uh, events or uh, whatever it happens to be, unless they're the one doing it, then the other person's not good enough. Anybody else is not good enough. And that's not biblical, is it? It's not scriptural. Every one of us is called to the same task. To love God, to love one another. To spur each other on to love and good works. The Bible says it over and over that it's a body ministry. It's not a top-down ministry. It's not even a bottom-up ministry. Leadership is servant leadership. That's what the Bible tells us, that the leaders are there to serve, but not necessarily to be the ones that are there to make everything happen. They're there to serve as a model of what life as a Christian looks like. And that's what Paul does for us, doesn't he? It's what Peter does for us. That's why the Bible tells us the story of Peter and Paul getting into an argument with one another. Yes, it shows them in some ways in a bad light, these two leaders of the church arguing with one another. But it also shows how neither one saw the other person as being better or, or higher up. If you can't tell me what to do. And so Paul was able to tell Peter, hey, you might be seen as the head of the church by some. That doesn't mean you've got it all right. And we should be able to do that for one another, shouldn't we? That we speak the words of Scripture to one another. It would be easy to say that we are in the middle of a pandemic, so we shouldn't worry about where God is wanting us to go as a church. But throughout history and throughout the world, there has been and always will be obstacles for the gospel to overcome. We've got it easy in Australia, don't we? Even with this virus, we've got it easy. Try going to the Middle East. Try going to parts of Africa. Go to parts of, of Central Asia. And many parts of this world. We've got it so easy compared to them. And yet in some ways, we pale in comparison to their faith. We need to look to them, just as they look to us as well. It'd be easy to say, don't worry about it all. But we must not forget that we have a creative God, don't we? If our God can create everything out of nothing, we don't have to worry, do we? Our God can come up with creative solutions to our problems, to this world's problems, to the church's problems. He's made us in His image. So together with Him, we can and must find ways forward so that no person, and this is the core of why, why we're here, that no person ever has the excuse that they didn't hear Jesus' message. Ultimately, that's what we want, isn't it? To not see any person left behind. It's the American army one of those. No person left behind. We don't want to see anybody ever go to hell because they didn't have the opportunity to hear. If they're going to go to hell, it's because they chose to, not because we chose not to speak. That's why we're here. So to finish off, I want to hear your thoughts. Many of you have already heard what we're trying to do as a church. You've seen the posters, we've talked about it in the past. I want to hear what your thoughts are on that today. What's God saying to you, to what you've heard this morning?